Hello, hello, you sons of bitches out there. Welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands. I'm Connor. That's Phil. Oh, wow. We're like, being aggressive with it today. Yeah, well, you know, these people. Scallywags. These. <laughs> That's right. Please, Phil. All right. I didn't mean to... Founders. This is like, you. oh, I'm, I'm a terrible influence. What if your parents hear you talking this way? That's a good point. <laughs> and I will blame you. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. <laughs> it was Connor! First he said a <laughs> mild slayer, and then, yes, I said scallywax. Welcome. Welcome to Heavy Hands. We've got UFC 307 on the horizon after, uh, I gotta say, a really, um, pretty solid card in Paris. Granted, I didn't watch all of it and I certainly did not, uh, watch it, uh, live. So I got to skip through whatever filler there might have been. I got the sense though, uh, just from the replay video, that I watched that it was a pretty well paced card. It certainly had a lot of exciting fights and a performance, uh, a series of performances that probably made the French crowd much happier than, um, whatever, uh, Mexicans were actually present at UFC 306. Mm -hmm. And also just a much better crowd than the crowd at UFC 306. That is the, absolutely true. The French crowd was super into it. As, as would a crowd like, uh, in some arena in LA or God forbid in Mexico would have certainly been mm -hmm. crazy and, and high energy for 306. Uh, but yeah, the, the, uh, Paris crowd was awesome. Really, really added to the event as well. Um, so we'll see if we have time to mention a couple things from that at the end of today's show. But UFC 307 is the big ticket. And of course that has Alex Pereira making yet another title defense, uh, except this time they forgot to book a top five contender. <laughs> they couldn't find yeah. any. They couldn't find any. Well, they're just going down the list, and they were like, uh, he's already beaten uh, this flawed striker, this flawed striker, this flawed striker, and they just, you just see them like jumping straight past my left and going, what about <laughs> this flawed striker? I mean, there's a part of me, a, a principled core that wants to, uh, defend Magomed Ankalaev's stake. Mm. But also, I do really. And it's also pretty funny. <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny <laughs> that they just jumped right over him. <laughs> Nobody wants to see you. Nobody got time for that, Magomed. Wait in line. Most, uh, the most the most like most cruel thing is that he tries to strike with people. It's not even like he blankets. <laughs> yeah, it's not even like he blankets people. He's like, "What do you want from me? I knocked out Johnny Walker." <laughs> Um, I knocked out Ewan Kudalaba twice. Isn't that what you want? So, Alex Spinetta versus Khalil Roundtree. As a matchup, I don't hate it. Like, it, it's fine. I'm, I'm sure it will be, uh, cool to watch. I'm sure something horrible will happen to the human body. Uh, it's just, uh, it just sort of comes out of nowhere. That's, that's the only <laughs> real complaint for it. it. It does not feel like the title fight to make, but whatever. Um, supporting that. We've got uh, Raquel Pennington. Remember the cheese bantamweight champ? Remember? She's fighting Julie. I do. I sort of did. It was like, um, it was like a, oh yeah, when I saw her on the card. Like it was in there, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really a part of my active yeah. memory. Uh, she's defending against Juliana Pena. We'll probably talk about that. Uh, and then one that I'm very much looking forward to and afraid of, Jose Aldo versus the streaking Mario Bautista, a fighter I've really enjoyed watching uh, rise to contention and quite possibly a very dangerous opponent for Aldo in his now second post third or fourth retirement fight. 
I can't remember which retirement that was. And uh, there's some other stuff, too. But let's start off with the main event. Alex Pereira, Khalil Roundtree. What do you, uh, what do you think, Phil? Um, uh, part of me thinks that if they keep running these matchups past Alex Pereira, then eventually someone's going to clean his clock. Yeah. They're just like, ah, oh, here's a, you know, powerful, dangerous hitter who's stylistically, like, super unfavored. Eventually one of them will hit him hard and he'll fall over. Um, but the difficulty is, is obviously, you know, picking when it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, they just run this, this particular experiment infinite times. Uh, yeah, eventually it will, it will happen. Other than that, I, it's, it's impossible to pick even this kind of weirdly rejuvenated and also, uh, equally, let's say, stylistically coddled version of Khalil Roundtree. Mm. Uh, uh, beat Alex Pereira because this is the other thing about Khalil's recent streak is that it's almost all against people that wouldn't push him in the ways which have uh, consistently, which have previously kind of caused yeah. him to crumble. Yeah, I mean the interesting thing about the Pereira fight is that Pereira isn't necessarily. Kind of stylistically, the kind of guy to do that either. But he is also just the kind of person that makes people crumble regardless. Yeah. Yeah. He's sort of, um, most of the light heavyweights down the rankings are so kind of, uh, one dimensional and, uh, and sort of shallow even in their one dimension that, uh, mm-hmm. Pereira sort of, uh, defies. <laughs> The, the style matchup rules that might be suggested from the fact that, uh, you know, it's like, uh, well, I mean, shit, it wasn't that long ago. Khalil Roundtree, I was, I was going to say he lost to, you know, grapplers. That was the weakness, mm-hmm. but it wasn't that long ago. He sort of just got out kickboxed by Marcin Prochnio. Yep. That was 2021 and he just sort of got low kicked. Um, by like a very patient and and pretty consistent long range striker, and and that is certainly a mode of Alex Pereira's um, that he has access to. So even that kind of fight, it's not like we've never seen him lose that before. And uh, and that was Marching Pracnio. <laughs> Marching Pracnio. You know, much yeah, as much I mean, as I that, love the guy. The- this is the thing, is that I, I kind of, you know, I, I like Philip Roundtree. Sure, who doesn't? He's, he's one of those guys where you get the, you get the impression that you are not really seeing a, you're not really seeing a natural fighter in there. Yeah. As in, you know, that you're seeing someone who's actually deep down, like, somewhat, uh, gentle and unsure of themselves. He reminds yeah. me of, like, Uriah Hall or Floyd Patterson or one of these guys where they're just like ferociously violent in in some ways. Yeah. But they just, you know, the way they act both in the cage and outside of it makes you think that is really not who you are. You are a, you know, a quiet person who has somehow been shackled with the, uh, uh, shackled and or blessed with the like physicality of a complete beast. Yeah. I mean, maybe, um, he he wasn't even sh- I mean he worked for it you know like the story is Khalil Roundtree was like well over 300 pounds when he began training mm-hmm. which is probably why it's like uh <clears throat> he's sort of like this is the MMA version of uh of uh a, a, a woman who was like an ugly teenager who has a massive glow up as yeah, she yeah. grows into adulthood <laughs> he's He's sort of MMA's appreciative lover, don't you find? <laughs> He's still mm-hmm. got the low, <laughs> the low self-esteem of an ugly girl, but uh, he, he's yeah. turned into a big muscle man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think it's difficult not to, not to kind of appreciate him and his yeah his little like run and streak that he's been on, which yeah. is you know generally been pretty impressive and cool to watch and. He is someone who can do, like, 
cool things. He's yeah. a sharp counterpuncher. He's a dangerous low kicker. He's, um, yeah, those things. He knows how to use these um, uh, threats to set up other things. He's got some some trickiness to his game at range. He can counter punch decently well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot to like about uh, Khalil Roundtree. But yeah, I do think, I feel like he's also, and he has that kind of steady progression of someone who is working very hard mm-hmm. without necessarily having the, you know, lightning quick leaps of someone who is intuitively getting everything that's going on. So that we have sort of seen him steadily get a, get a little bit better over time, just piling up improvements little on little. On little. Uh, whilst the sort of core flaws can still be there, and in a way that, like, you know, rote and well-schooled fighters can, he can often get into losing them and simply continues losing them for the rest of the fight because he can't figure out a way out of it. Yeah. Or where he just gets overwhelmed and his mind gets blanked, as in the Iwan Kutalab fight. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you could... uh you could certainly argue that one of the, well, I don't know. There's a couple ways you could interpret this. I, my impression of the recent wins of Khalil Roundtree's of this streak is that, um, it's mostly been opponents who just, uh, don't know how to push him. Mm-hmm. Whether on the feet or, uh, with the grappling that used to be, uh, you know, the bane of his existence. That he's, he's gotten opponents who are very much cowed by the first counter he touches them with, or are made very uncomfortable by his low kicks at range, and, um, and either end up getting pressured by him, or as in the case of like Anthony Smith, or Chris Dawkins for that matter, um, make a really crude attempt at pressuring Khalil, which, uh, doesn't lead to much. I mean, Anthony Smith was a very cautious pressure performance where he couldn't actually persuade himself to throw very often, um, because of the counters of Roundtree and Dawkins, uh, just tried to run at him. And, and that, that didn't work either. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think he's just, uh, he's gotten slightly fortunate with his matchmaking. To, uh, to have these performances be as, as comfortable as they are because they're all one way traffic. They're all pretty, uh, relaxing wins for Khalil Roundtree. And I'm, I'm still very curious what he looks like when somebody makes him uncomfortable. Uh, and he just gets stuck, yeah. in, stuck in a rut, you know? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, yeah, a few of those fights I find are illustrative and, and not really in ways which make me particularly optimistic for his chances to pull a freaky upset. Mm-hmm. Um, like the Smith fight, uh, it's, you know, Anthony Smith is not an unpressurable fighter. He's not someone that you actually particularly want to let lead on you. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a, you know, Sharp jab, he can build off it, but he's defensively, uh, quite, like, lackadaisical. In one way, it's, in some ways, it's like, it's impressive that Khalil was able to run a primarily defensive game against him and still win quite easily. Mm-hmm. But, like, from a sort of directionality perspective, it, uh, it doesn't bode well for how he's going to approach Pereira, because that's what we've seen other people doing to Pereira, notably, uh, Jury in their rematch. He was like, I'm going to counterpunch this guy. Oh, yeah. Um, I do think Khalil has better but, defense than Jury. I mean, if that's for what that's worth. Yeah. He's, he's, that's, <laughs> yes. He has much better defense than Jury. I like, I, I like it was, it was genuinely like a pretty impressive performance against, against Smith. But the other thing that I find myself thinking is, like, is Khalil that much better at dealing with low kicks than he used to be? That is a very good question, yes. The early part of that, uh, both against Smith and I think against, yeah, Robeson. Yeah. There was Robeson, like, even more uh, notably, like, he, he just ate like a bunch of low kicks. His main... 
uh, tactic to deal with them is either that he just tries to counter them immediately, or that uh, he can just he just starts low kicking. You know, he'll start low kicking with his opponent, and then in both cases, he just drives them out of the pocket with sheer power. Mm-hmm. And they're like, "I don't want to low kick with this guy, and I don't want to risk the counters." And this obviously runs into like several philosophical problems against uh, Alex Pereira, mm-hmm. which are like amongst them are one. It's very difficult to counter Alex Pereira's low kicks because he doesn't wind up on them a lot. And uh, secondly, like yeah, he's he is looking to. That's like his game. He is looking to draw those counters out of you so that he can mm-hmm. he can counter the counter. Mm-hmm. Like uh, to be there waiting on Alex Pereira's low kicks, uh, so that you can counter them is is really like what he does in many ways. Yeah. Um and so yeah, I think it's it, it doesn't signify good things for Khalil. No, it doesn't feel like it. Yeah, the low kicks have been I mean that that's a major reason that he lost that fight to uh Procneo that I mentioned. Uh just uh ate a ton of low kicks uh, William Knight style uh at the yeah. edge of Procneo's range. He also got my cat is just yelling for no reason. Jesus. Uh, he also got, um, he ate quite a few low kicks, uh, in the fight with, uh, Dustin Jacoby. Yep. And, um, and also just, uh, got, looked pretty uncomfortable for decent stretches of that fight. Uh, just getting stuck on the end of, uh, Jacoby's jab. This is the thing, like, uh, Anthony Smith, who not only did the classic MMA fighter thing of, having the low kicks be effective and then completely forgetting about them for the rest of the fight. But Cat. Jesus Christ, can you hear this? <laughs> no. God, we're <laughs> we're both working here in this apartment. He's just walking around screaming. He's not he must the be a, time to make the biggest impact. Must be a round tree fan. Um but uh in addition to f- just forgetting the low kicks uh, entirely, Smith didn't, didn't fill the space at all that he was, that, that he, he should have had some command of due to all the, the forward movement, all the pressure he was applying to Roundtree. Um, but he didn't just like touch him with the jab. Another weapon which Anthony Smith has that is good and effective that he just does not use nearly enough. Uh, and so he kept like, Doing that thing where you get into range and then you get visibly nervous and you tense up and the guy who's doing nothing but waiting for you to throw just waits for you to throw and you throw something big. You try to knock him out with a right hand and then he ducks and flings a right hook and it catches you every single time this happens. That was the kind of exchange that repeated itself against Anthony Smith. Uh, so I look at like the Procneo fight, I look at the Jacoby fight, and I, and then I look at, in particular, the latest Alex Pereira fight against uh, the rematch with Prochaska, which I thought was maybe the best overall performance Pereira has had in the UFC. Mm-hmm. Because this yep. is a very relaxed, uh, long range kicking display. But it is also a really active and consistent jabbing performance from Pereira. Body jabs, mm-hmm. jabs to the chest, uh, jabbing on the reset, defensive jabs, counter jabs, any which way he could keep Prochaska from just getting to him for free. Pereira was just sticking that jab in his face or sticking it in his gut, uh, over and over. And, um, I think that could be like the most boring version of this fight. And I think it would be one I would just have to pick Pereira in. I suppose. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Go, go on. If you got something. I mean, yeah. I mean, that, that's just the thing is that uh, it is yet another Pereira fight where you're just like, 
I cannot find a way to pick his opponent, really. Yeah. Apart from they just land the shot of their life on Alex Pereira's giant head. Pretty much. And there's no way that that's not a possibility in all of these matchups, whether it's Jamal Hill or Yiri or Khalil. Mm-hmm. Uh, but honestly, if I had to, if I had to like, uh, list, if I had to like order them in terms of like which one I thought was like least likely to do it. <laughs> Uh, it probably would be like close. Uh, maybe Khalil would be the least likely. I don't know. It would, it would be it would be between him and um and Jamal. I think Jiri probably had the best chance, which again makes this all the more unlike <laughs> unlikely seeming because Jiri was the only one who I think really had the ability to like burst through distance and cover space and hit Pereira on his retreats and yeah. take advantage of the fact that he was not the fastest guy in the world and so on and so forth. Whereas both uh, Khalil and Jamal were are pretty plodding guys. Yeah, at least Khalil um, is not uh, already uh, panicking and uncomfortable the moment he's not pressuring, like Jamal Hill. Because mm-hmm. Jamal Hill is like... Given that this was a fight where Pineda chose to come forward and got and got Hilda back into the fence, that particular version of that fight is one I would never, ever, ever expect Jamal Hill to win. Yeah, uh, right that true. that is a version that is a kind of Pineda fight where Khalil Roundtree will still have chances. Uh, in particular, yeah, that's fair. As as I said, I don't want to downplay like he did genuinely good look good against Anthony Smith, and Anthony Smith is, if nothing else, like a a, a potent and difficult to read offensive threat most of the time. If you just, um, is, um if you just trying to try to counter punch against him. Yeah, but yeah, it's true. Which is pretty much all he was trying to do. Um, I'll also note mm-hmm. the fact that um, Pereira has been uh, susceptible to right hands more than anything else, and mm-hmm. uh, Roundtree's favorite counter. Is the right hook, the southpaw right hook. Yes. Which can be a particularly tricky kind of powerful left, uh, right hand to have to deal with. And one that, um, a lot of fighters are not looking for in the open stance matchup. But yeah. it's also got the left hook, <laughs> uh, which is dangerous against any stance and, um, may very well be the kind of threat that Roundtree is not used to looking for, uh, in his preferred southpaw stance. So that goes both ways a bit, but yeah, I mean, that's really all you can say is that Browntree can time a counter. He's got like only two ideas of how to counter people for the most part, but, um, sometimes that works to your benefit. You're not uh, constantly trying, searching for ideas. You're just trying to fine tune the one that you uh, know will work if you get it right. But I don't know. Hanging back, trying to counter Pereira. Um, probably being on the losing end of the leg kick battle for as long as uh, you're not exchanging in the pocket with him and then having to exchange in the pocket with him um, probably at his behest. Mm-hmm. This, um, this just, just, just doesn't sound like a kind of fight I, I would want to be in. Yeah. So, surprise, surprise. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, it's definitely possible to imagine that he could basically recreate uh, the Izzy KO from their recent fight. Yeah. Gets backed into the cage, whatever, maybe overcommits a little bit and just decks him. But again, it just, it just has to be the shot of his life. Pretty much. I'll be, I will be genuinely shocked if uh, Roundtree has like a a round winning performance against Alex Pereira. Yeah, yeah. A performance where he he takes over the flow of the fight, right? Mhm. Yeah, that's difficult to see. So, um no surprises whatsoever. We're both picking Alex Pereira. Uh like all Alex Pereira fights, it uh should be a blast to watch. And um I really don't mean to uh discount Roundtree. I don't uh you know, we like the guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just, uh, it, it looks like a pretty tough matchup. Yeah. 
I mean, if he can pull it out and suddenly, you know, have the performance of a lifetime, it'd be, I would be very, very impressed and I'll be genuinely made up for him. Cause yeah. Oh, for sure. Great. Yes. Yeah. As of now, I cannot pick it. No matter what happens, <laughs> no matter what happens in this fight, I'm not going to go back. I don't think I'm going to go back in, uh, in retrospect and be like, oh yeah, I definitely should have picked Khalil Rountree. Damn, I missed, I missed this key detail or something. I think we hit most of the yeah, details. Yeah. I, I think, uh, if he wins, that will be, uh, either one of the fortunate things we mentioned or a very surprising performance that, uh, that leads mm-hmm. to that. Uh, all right. Well, let's call the, uh, the main event coverage there then and take a quick break. When we come back, I suppose we're going to talk about Raquel Pennington versus Juliana Pena and uh, Jose Aldo versus Mario Bautista. A very meaningful bantamweight fight is uh, next up after that and maybe a couple other things beside. We'll get to that after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. The women's bantamweight title is on the line. Yes, that's right. Raquel Pennington is the champion who holds that title. Her opponent, somehow still the number one ranked contender in this division. Oh my God. Juliana Pena has not fought since 2022 when she had that Utterly one-sided loss to Amanda Nunes. Mm -hmm. She has been sitting on a number one ranking since one of the, I mean, you know, I don't like to use the word fluke. Uh, I think Nunes definitely just straight up had a legitimately bad night in their first fight. And Pena had one good idea, one weird trick that really surprised her. But when you run a fight back... And the rematch looks like that, that rematch did. Um, it sort of undermines <laughs> the initial success. And it sort of, it would sort of, I think, in most other cases, uh, probably knock you down the rankings a little bit. I would assume, like, we're not just looking at who beat you, but how you lost, right? That has to be part of it. Um, and then I look at the rest of the rankings and I think who is, who has, uh, gotten the accomplishments to put them clearly over Juliana Pena? Is it Catlin Vieira? Is it Ma- Macy Chase? Right? Is it Macy Chasen? Is it Norma Dumont? They're all top five bantamweights. Is it Irena Aldana? Who was as badly prepared as Alexa Grasso a few weekends ago? She's number six. I mean, yep. the only one of any interest whatsoever, and I honestly wonder why she's not fighting for the title right now, is Kayla Harrison. Because uh, they want Juliana Pena to win this, because she's the only. How old is Juliana Pena? At this point, because she was like the young, fresh face of women. I'm going to say at, one point. at least 35. Let's see. Yes, she is 35. <laughs> yeah, she's 35. She's a mother. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's not the the fresh young contender anymore. Um, she's really like Pennington's generation of contendership, right? Yeah, they're, they're uh, yeah. Pennington was a uh, was you know a young prospect when she first started in uh, in, yeah. in the UFC as well, really. Yeah, um, yeah. She's been doing this for a long ass time. I mean, this is obviously not a particularly unique thing to say, but the the main thing is obviously that like the women's bantamweight division is simply. 
almost exactly the same as the one that both Ronda Rousey and yeah. uh, and Amanda Nunes just ruled over. And yeah. it's never changed. It has simply gotten old. Yeah, honestly. I mean, there are some new names in there, but none of them really stand out uh, as, 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 as knocking at the gates, except for Kayla Harrison, who is not herself, um, I don't think, that much uh, younger and has competed for quite a while, just not in the UFC and also not mostly at bantamweight. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very motley collection of so-called contenders, and I suppose Jelena Pena, for that reason, has just been sitting at number one since getting uh, killed eight times over five rounds by Amanda Nunes in 2022. Again, that was her last fight. So, uh, what do you think, Phil? Is Pena going to she's going to do it again? She's going to have one more brilliant trick that uh, Pennington can't deal with? I mean, this fight isn't actually very easy to call. <laughs> well, uh because Pena at her best is a is well, uh, not a striker. And this was at least partially like the, the, both the genius and the stupidity of her fights with Amanda Nunez. Uh, yeah. Nunez. Cause she was, uh, you know, really convinced herself that she was like genuinely good on the feet by the time their second fight came around. Yeah. And, and she isn't. And, Raquel Pennington has many flaws, right? Uh, she's slow footed. Uh, she kind of pours her punches a bit. Um, she's, what's the right word to sort of describe? She's got this kind of, uh, sumo esque way of sort of moving around the cage. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then she can't really like deliver major power behind her shots. She kind of, you know, turns her punches over in the bad way. Um, yeah, so, so plodding, like, not particularly powerful. None of these are good things to me. I think she she's... can also handle herself in exchanges, and she does have a jab. Yeah. And she's not actually super easy to out wrestle. No, she's actually quite difficult to out wrestle. She's also, uh, never been submitted since her, uh, pro debut, I believe, against Kat Zingano. Uh, which is a crazy, aggressive fighter to beat any young prospect with a surprising submission, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, also, she's never been, other than that, never been finished in any way, except for the mercy stoppage in that fight with Amanda Nunes, where she was just hanging on mm-hmm. grittily the entire time regardless. And if they hadn't stopped it the round before, it's almost like, why stop it when they did? You know? She was, yeah. she was at least, she was in just as bad a way then as she was around or two rounds earlier. Uh, it was just like, okay, we don't need to see any more of this. But certainly yeah. a testament to her toughness and how difficult it is to actually put her away. Yep. So we have a pretty stout, physically strong defensive wrestler who is a patient, solid, defensive grappler when she needs to be. Uh, we'll just ride out bad positions and keep her, you know, keep wrist control on the hand that's trying to choke her or whatever and ride it out. Who is also a capable, if um, sort of undramatic boxer. Mm-hmm. And... Juliana Pena only wins when she can uh, scare somebody and overwhelm them and make yeah. make them panic and break, basically. Yeah. The obvious... Uh, so, yeah, stylistically, I would actually probably favor Raquel Bennington. Um, Me too. The only, like, major wrinkle in here, and it is a major one, is obviously, like, physicality. Because Pena has been able to, uh, you know... Badly shake up Amanda Nunes when, uh, and you know, finish Amanda Nunes when uh, Pennington couldn't even get near her because she was just sort of yeah. 
plodding steadily up to her, waiting to see if she could do anything about anything that was coming back, and the answer was no. Yeah, true. And, you know, she was, Penny was able to, like, blitz briefly, like, Valentina Shevchenko, because she can just cover distance and she's very aggressive and scary. So, yeah, there's a, um, you know, which way, Western woman, I guess, is the, um, <laughs> uh-huh. thing here, you know. Do you, do you pick, do you go the, uh, Bilal Muhammad route of like this, uh, like solid journeyman seeming fighter has just sort of built up enough experience, uh, that they're going to be able to just control and beat their opponent? Or is it still the Dreykus era? Is, is Pena simply just like too physical or someone like, uh, Raquel Pennington, who has never beaten a good athlete, really. I mean, you know, she beat uh, a pretty good athlete, and uh, by the standards of the division, and Myra Bueno Silva to win her yeah, title. Yeah. That's true. At, at the very least, another um, pretty f- like strong, physically powerful uh, fighter who who certainly tied her up in clinches and got on her back at one point and. I just, Pennington's pretty unflappable, you know, unless you have, um, some massive advantage like Nunez had over her, which was a, 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 a manifold advantage, right? Like length, uh-huh. speed, power, everything, uh, and better technique and, um, sort of better shot selection than any other woman in the division. All of these, these things combined were enough to simply uh, keep Pennington out of the fight for the most part. Mm-hmm. But she was still hanging tough. And then everyone else who has does not have this perfect confluence of advantages, um, even the pretty good athletes, like, they, they, they basically beat Pennington when they beat her by finding a different way of just shutting her out of the fight. Like Holly Holm... Yep. In both of her terrible fights with Pennington, just sort of not engaging except when it's to hold on to a clutch. Both of which Holly, Holly Holm arguably lost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these aren't the most uh, persuasive performances. Um, or like yeah, Jermaine really, Durandamay. Been, yes. As I was going to say, it's like, it's really been like really big, <laughs> like, uh, straight punches. We've just been able to like, and yeah, it's re- really big straight punches who are actually genuinely quite good strikers that have been able to beat Raquel Pennington. Yeah, I mean, if you forget about like, the... Notably, uh, like, Holly Holm did much, much worse than Jermaine Durandamy yes. and Amanda Nunes. Yeah, if you, and if you forget about half her game, Jermaine Durandamy is about as good as Amanda Nunes. You know? Yeah, I mean, on the feet, she's arguably, exactly. she is arguably better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's she's she presents many of the exact same problems as a, a striking opponent at range. Um. So I uh, I just like I don't think it's going to be pretty, but uh, Pennington's title win wasn't pretty <laughs> or interesting. <laughs> it's it still won her the title. So I'm I'm definitely taking Rocky here. I will also say, yeah. I know I've pointed I mean, this, this out before, but she has improved in the uh, sharpness of her punches in the last few years. You know, she still needs, it has to be a very comfortable pace that she can kind of settle into, but she has gotten a little better at actually putting some snap and some weight transfer in her shots. You know, she hasn't just stopped yeah. improving. It's just a very steady improvement that you expect out of... um Non elite athletes. Yeah. And I think it's just also that she's been. She's just always had like a, a, a strange stance and like, you know, her biomechanics are just weird at this point. Yeah. And they're never really, you know, she'd have to relearn everything from scratch and she isn't doing that uh, to really be able to like hit with power. Uh, but yeah, I think she's she has steadily gone about, you know, I mean, going all the way back to like that, the fight against Misha Tate where she just completely shut her out with a jab. Yep. Um, 
she's actually and again like Holly Holm could not really outstrike her. She had to she had to just hold her against the fence and hope that the judges gave it to her. Um in Peña's in Peña's uh favor is the fact that like Peña is one of those sort of uh, crazy people who just thinks that they're always going to win, mm-hmm. which is very useful. I don't think like Peña's going to fold if things start going south for her, which means it could actually be like quite a um it's probably going to be like a very scrappy fight uh, in the later um, in the later rounds. Um, I am going to pick uh, Rocky, and I'm going to pick her by uh, like bulldog choke. <laughs> because... She's done it before. She's done it before. She actually has quite a good front headlock game. And, like, Pena just occasionally just forgets. She's one of those fighters that just, like... I mean, she... Pena, forgets that the other person has grappling. Pena got guillotined by Jermaine Durandamy. Exactly. We were just talking around the fact before that Durandamy is only mm-hmm. has a striking game. And she guillotined Pena. I mean, that is... that That's, like... That is this division's equivalent of Ryan Bader getting guillotined by Tito Ortiz. It really is. It's even funnier, let's be honest. <laughs> Jermaine Durandamy does not... She has just refused to learn how to wrestle and grapple for a very long mm-hmm. time. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so, yeah Pena will and, just... And that's uh, been a consistent thing with Pena is that she yeah. completely forgets. She treats people as strike... You know, if she sees someone who's a striker... She completely forgets that they can do the grapple. It's true. I mean, really, pick, in any position, she I'm is going to pick Rocky to tap her. In any position <laughs> or 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 phase, she is prone to just fling herself into danger. So, uh, yeah, I don't know about the submission call. I'd certainly love to see it. I think we're looking at a uh, the kind of decision where Pena probably still picks up two, arguably three rounds, just by going crazy mm-hmm. in the right spots. Yep. Um, or possibly like taking the back, for example, is a, a thing that can happen to uh, Pennington because she's slow. Mm-hmm. But I think Pennington will hold it together, and I think she'll get a she'll get a lot of uh, a lot of points just uh, just poking at uh, Pena with the jab and landing the counter right hand and whatnot from range. Uh, gotta have two title fights on these pay per views. <laughs> You gotta have it. Get that value for money. <laughs> I wish I was more enthusiastic. I, I do kind of, I like Rocky Pennington. Like, I've always liked her. I, I have a soft spot for her, but at the same time, I don't really get excited <laughs> about many of her fights. It's more like I'm happy for her when she wins, but, you know, I don't need the whole Christmas card. You don't have to tell me everything that's been going on for you this year. Just. <laughs> Uh, okay. No, no, I'm still, I'm still, I still like Rocky. Yeah, uh, me too. Yes, I'm 100% not expecting anyone else to be remotely interested in this fight. I'm barely interested, and I like her. Mm-hmm. So, uh, okay. Let's take one more break, then. When we come back, uh, Jose Aldo versus Mario Bautista, maybe a couple other things, too. We'll get to that after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve, so thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Let's talk about these uh, bantamweights. The great, the legend, Jose Aldo, is uh, no longer retired. He, I think, retired after that loss to Mirab Duelish Willie. Took a took a couple boxing matches, um, rented out his uh, garage to uh, Jair Bolsonaro, <laughs> and now yeah. he's back. Uh, he uh, had that fight with Jonathan Martinez. That was his first post retirement uh, fight, and um, 
still mostly looked like Jose Aldo and still definitely had a, well, he had a, he had a big psychological effect, I think, on, on poor young, uh, Jonathan Martinez, who, uh, was just, uh, as a lot of people are, really, really shook by the prospect of fighting Jose Aldo. In fact, I know there's a lot more to it, but I think that is probably the one factor that you can apply across the board, uh, to all of these, like, post championship fights of Jose's. Which determines whether he wins or loses. Is, is the opponent going to, is it possible to get them into a state where they sort of forget how to fight because they're overalled by what Aldo is doing? And all the guys who have any susceptibility to that at all, uh, just get carved up by Jose eventually. And the few that just don't give a fuck, um, and just fight Jose the way they would fight anybody else, tend to beat him. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, I, that's obviously a very broad way of looking at it, but uh, it's certainly, you can see a mental breakdown either happening or not happening in all of these fights, and whether or not that breakdown happens uh, determines whether they can actually make Jose uncomfortable. Yeah, for me, I think it's less about, like, the mystique of Jose Aldo, and it's more about uh people have to be it's more about how comfortable are you with stuff not working mhm like people who are willing you know like marab for what or, or whatever like uh, someone like marab who is yeah. perfectly happy to just you know burn rounds doing whatever or you know volkanovsky Who's just, yep. you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, well, sure, I'm racking up points. I ain't landing anything clean, but doesn't matter. I'm winning. Or, um, uh, Piotr Jan, for that matter, who will have a gigantic swing miss and in his brain of brains will think, how can I throw something really scary after that miss that takes advantage of the move he had to make to evade it? Hmm. People who are happy with missing, with, with being confronted with rock solid defense and don't, uh, get discouraged. Because, you know, we talked before about the kind of mental cardio that comes with just like the, the mental cardio tax that comes with just missing things. Right. You know, you you throw out punches expecting them to land cleanly and there's just like this, you know, the impact just doesn't feel like it should. Yeah. The kicks don't feel like they should. Nothing feels right. Mm-hmm. And anyone... You know, you, you get in on what you think is a great takedown. You know, that, that great, uh, article by, who was it? Um, did, you know, what it was like to fight Jose Aldo. And he was like, you know, you get in on great takedowns. I think, uh, I think Chad, uh, Chad Dundas might have done that one. It definitely wasn't Chad Dundas. It was, ah, I forget. But, you know, the night we fought Aldo, everyone, everyone knows. Yeah. Oh, know shit. Who was that? Show. Yeah. Go on. Um, yeah, and I think that sort of feeling of sort of fighting in sponge, like nothing you do is is actually landing properly, is incredibly disorienting for a lot of fighters. And those that, yeah, as you said, like don't don't let that get to them, have done a lot better. Yeah, it was. I guess uh, the question is like, it was Sean El How much? By is, the way. Yes, that's right. Sorry, Absolutely. Sean, for thinking you were Chad Dundas. <laughs> Sometimes he writes stuff um, like that. Um, and the question is, like, how much is, uh, Batista, like, one of these guys? How yeah. much is he someone who can be happy with missing? Who can be happy with racking up points? Who can be happy with, uh, just, uh, like, small, with, like, small victories? Yeah. And I don't think he is that guy. Oh, you don't? Which brings oh. me to the other question. Which is, at what point does it stop working for Jose Aldo? I, um, I mean, yeah, that, that, that is a question we should talk about. I kind of wonder if Mario Batista isn't that kind of guy. You think? Batista, um, is a, is a high output fighter. Uh, particularly as a fight goes on. He, he is somebody who, 
has at times been really vulnerable early. I think he's shored that up and kind of accepted that he's going to have a, uh, he's not going to push it too hard early and get caught. <clears throat> and he will kind of settle into the fight first. But, you know, you look at the third round of that fight with Ricky Simone. It's a lot of pressure and not a lot of shots landing for about the first half of that round. But the pressure does not stop. Mario Batista will keep testing your defense, keep throwing. Every time you throw back, uh, will surge after you with three punches. I mean, he, he is a natural combination striker and I think a pretty natural pressure fighter. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know, like, the, the thing is, like, there is still an element of mystique here, which th this is why I brought it up first. It does have to be considered because, um, I like your point about, you know, you, you, you touch the defense and you're like, oh shit, nothing's working. For Jonathan Martinez, uh, in Aldo's last fight, a ton of his shit was actually working. Like, he was landing the jabs on Jose Aldo. Aldo was trying to pull back for them and evade them, and, like, a, a lot of those initial contacts were, in fact, made. But he still couldn't convince himself that that meant he had any right to actually build some kind of attack. He was still... Yeah, it's the same as, like, Frankie Edgar with his low kicks. Right. Yeah, he was still cowed by the prospect of actually doing something with these initial successes. It's not that Jose was just able to effortlessly defend every punch he threw. Um, and, and I, I, I do see Batista as a guy who just, uh, is, is down for the scrap and will up the pressure and just put combinations together no matter what, uh, particularly in the second and third rounds. I, I don't know. I'm a little nervous about this one for, uh, Jose, but, uh, I mean, wh why do you, why do you read Batista that way? Uh, I guess it's just because he takes so long to build. He he took like quite long to build into the fight against a relatively crude fighter like Simon or Simone. Sorry. Yeah, Simone. Yeah, he, he he tends to have slow starts. I mean, he used to have crazy fast starts and and would uh, would uh, get himself into trouble as a result. But um, you know, you look at the second and third round. I mean, I. Simone's had a bad uh, run of luck, but uh, don't let that influence you into thinking that it's like he's an easy fight. And Batista yeah. went in there while having an eye on the constant threat of wrestling and defending most of the takedowns, particularly as the fight went on, um, but also having to think about scrambling to escape them, which he did every single time he got taken down. I, I recall you being impressed by that because... Yeah, yeah. When we talked about it, I was like, you're going to be surprised by Batista's scrambling. He just doesn't give up and accept bad positions. And he didn't. And while keeping all of that in mind, it is still a fight where he ends with, uh, he ends it in a position of like, if there were two minutes left, if there was another extra two minute bonus round, he would knock Ricky Simone out. Yeah. He is, he just is a guy who gets better and better, um, as a fight goes on. Sort of without fail, and it usually yeah, that's fair. Actually, I think you're. I'm. I'm. I'm once again, I, I think I'm probably underestimating him. I think you're right. Batista's my guy, so you know I might be biased in his favor, but I've I've been mm -hmm. I've had a pretty high opinion of him, um, going back a few years now, and uh, I guess to be fair to myself, um, he's kind of delivered. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's had a really good run and he has clearly gotten his best wins here at the end of it. And, um, I don't know. He's hittable too, you know, like he can absolutely, um, be caught on the counter. I think he will absolutely be susceptible to Jose Aldo's jabs. Simone had plenty of success against him with the straight punches. I think you could also be susceptible in spots to the low kicks if they make an appearance. In this uh, Jose Aldo fight, but um, he's also not like a defensive sieve. He does actually make adjustments. I just think Batista's a really, particularly when you get to round two, is just a really locked in fighter. 
He's very attentive, yeah. very focused, and very difficult to discourage. And uh, that's yeah, the reason I, I was... that's the reason I brought that up first. I think you you look at the people Jose's beating, and they all hit a point, usually pretty early, where they're just they just seem to think I'm screwed. Yeah, what if... I think it, yeah, it also actually speaks for him well that he's he does actually have a lot of throwaway in his offense. That's like, what I mean. Yeah, he is constantly just like working his way in by you know missing his jab and he doesn't care that's what i mean the idea that he's going to miss is built into how he attacks i think that's a very Mm -hmm. good quality to have it's not unlike again the um throwaway offense of piotr jan granted i mean piotr jan still you know you're gonna if you're gonna pressure jose aldo and make him fight you be prepared (laughs) that's i think of I i still think regularly of the uh legendary call of uh, Brian Stan during uh, Aldo Mendez too. When I believe he said, you want to make the champ work? Well, this is how he works as he was like thrashing Mendez around the cage. That's the thing. Like you, uh, you want to wake up the lion. Jose Aldo will still throw down and nail you. I mean, shit. There's a point where Jonathan Martinez uh, in that fight was trying to kind of muster the nerve to go after Aldo. And he comes out and he hits him with a big, um, a big left hook, I think, in a combination. And he gets excited and tries to follow up and Aldo blasts him with a right hand. Just, that's what Aldo does. Just dig in the toes and swing for the fences if somebody dares to try to mix it up with you. And if you're, um, as unbelievably tough and determined as Piotr Jan or even more so Max Holloway, you can turn that against him. But you have to be down to eat some pretty hellacious counters in the process. Um, I don't yeah. know. I, yeah, I think I think you've convinced me. I will pick uh, Mario Batista. I'm still not sure if I want to pick him. Yeah, you've convinced me. It's a, it's a, it's because he's too old. <laughs> uh, he's not going to be ready for Batista to jab his way into range and just his. I'm upping the pace. It's good. <laughs> Jose is going to look exactly the same, but he's just going to fall off, uh, just like a round faster than you expect him to, than he normally does. Cause that's, that's how he's, you know, that's what's going to be the, the issues is that he's going to like crumble under consistent pressure just that little bit faster than he used to. And yeah, I and mean, it's just going to be like an ugly third round. Yeah, good call, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult to tell how serious you're being sometimes, Phil. Have you ever been told that? Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Any perhaps heated conversations with exes where you've been told, I don't know what you're feeling. <laughs> Why can't you just express yourself? <laughs> this never happened. <laughs> No, I, I mean, yeah, that is the thing. Like, the version of this fight that Bautista wins, uh, probably gets really hairy, right? Really mm-hmm. hairy. Like, he's not gonna do what, um, Mirab or Volkanovsky did to Aldo. No. He's not going to, um, sort of take advantage of this variety of threats to just kind of find ways to sit on the initiative and keep Aldo from doing anything. If he's winning, mm-hmm. it's going to be by overwhelming Jose, and even yeah, just it's going to be the it is the Max Holloway yeah guilty arm thing, but he has to do it and he has to do it in three rounds. In three rounds, yeah. Which hey, you know Max Holloway only needed two, but uh, those were fights that I would not expect anyone else to even survive the shots he had to eat from Jose in the process. Mm-hmm. So it. It makes me think Batista has very real chances. Certainly, if Jose has an off night, just gets... well, I think both um, both Holloway fights were actually the end of round three. Are they really? Mm-hmm. I always thought of them both as round two, but I guess it's round two is the point at which you realize Aldo is going to lose. Yeah, but he still round hangs three is tough. Just a horrifying protracted beating, and I think yeah. it was round four in the Yarn fight, right? Oh, yeah, it was round five. Ugh. Yeah. There was still a, a, a long beating before the uh, final stoppage, but yeah, Aldo will uh, will hang tough and absorb it if he has to. Um, 
So I don't know. I mean, I'm still, I'm still pretty. Oh, you've convinced me. (laughs) That's another ugly Jose loss. Let's see if Connor Rebush. Boy. Yeah. I mean, you're doing it sarcastically. Um, I'm just going to sadness hedge pick Mario Batista. It's not even a full sadness hedge. Again, I, I like Batista a mm. lot too. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, he's he's clearly going places. Yeah, I mean, I think probably what is most likely to happen is that he will he will have a considerable success, but Aldo will also convince him to hold his horses uh, enough times mm-hmm. to keep him from truly overwhelming him. But I mean, the uh, pretty much the ideal outcome is that Aldo looks great in rounds one and two, and then uh, Batista uh, yeah, looks yeah, great yeah. in round three. Yeah, and then everyone's like, "Well, he won, but also you looked amazing." Yeah, kind of lost where you again. It doesn't yeah, hurt yeah. Batista's stock at all. Everyone's like, "Man, he did so great against yeah. Aldo," and we all know how great Aldo is. Yeah, and if he just had two more rounds, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be ideal. We'd all go home happy. Mm-hmm. But, uh, uh, whatever. I'm gonna pick Batista. Just s- simply to yeah. say that I really do think, um, he has the right kind of mental makeup to actually yeah. hold fast against a, uh, some, a, a fighter like Jose Aldo who's, who very often seems like indomitable. And I, I think a lot of people crumble when they feel that. And I don't think Batista is the kind of guy to crumble. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think I underrated him significantly before that Simone fight, and I'm going to try not to do that in future. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that a lot of the performances that Simone has looked super impressive in, uh, he is out there, um, dealing with grapplers mm-hmm. and wrestlers. And those are the people that he's striking against. Not that Ricky Simone has no striking game, for example. Uh, not that Damon Blackshear has no striking game, for example. But the really impressive thing about Batista is how he can keep his striking game going and his shit, his, his wrestling and grappling. I mean, those always make an appearance. And I mean, he was taking Ricky Simone down and getting on his back. Yeah. Uh, just the pressure. He'll mix it all together. But that's the really impressive thing watching Batista fight is how he can keep his sort of striking flow. He can keep his pressuring flow going while dealing with this takedown threat, it just doesn't affect his uh, processing ability the way it does so many MMA fighters when they have to be constantly aware of that threat. Um, the other side of that, though, is that, like, the, you know, he got knocked out by Trevin Jones. You know, I think, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it was a worse, ver- worse version of Bautista. But here is somebody who had a really, really simplistic, um, exploitable pure strikers kind of game and Batista did just run into a fight end encounter. Yep. He was crushing uh, up to the point that that happened, but he did run into the shot. So we'll see. He's in here against uh, the best striker in MMA history now. So <laughs> we'll see how that holds up. Um, are you actually picking him? Yeah. No, but you don't believe it. Now I feel worse about it. <laughs> I only partially believe it. I believe it's possible. Now you convince me. Well, all the rest of you out there, place your uh, children's college fund on Jose Aldo. Now that we've picked against him, you know we're wrong. Yep. Okay. Well, um, any other things that you uh, want to mention from this card or perhaps from last week's card in Paris? Uh, Let me think. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Delidze Holland is going to be an incredible technical matchup. I can't of believe of all the fights here. That's the one you want to talk about. Skill and will. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe that's the one you would pick. Yes, you can. I mean, I can, but still. I, I mean, there's not really that much to say. About that? Just, I, I agree. But it is... It is kind of interesting because it's like, is I, you just got to assume that Kevin's going to take him down and get submitted, right? 
That would be pretty cool. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it could look like, uh, the most terrible fight of all time where mm-hmm. <laughs> Roman Delizze is holding Kevin Holland against the fence, sort of, um, suggesting that he wants to take him down without really having any actual wrestling fundamentals to turn to. And that Kevin Holland is not yeah. going to be able to get out of these, <laughs> these protracted clinches. That's a version of the fight. So you're saying you are not fascinated by the <laughs> potential matchup between uh, Roman Delidze's re- offensive wrestling and uh, Kevin Holland's takedown defense. Yeah. I mean, this is the fabled stoppable force meets movable object <laughs> uh, matchup. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's uh, fa- favorite dynamic. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, like Hooking Buckley is just gonna take Stephen Thompson down a bunch mm-hmm. and possibly finish him on the ground. Yeah, um, I, it, that's that one I actually am interested in because if Joaquin Buckley goes in there right. as he may with a chip on his shoulder, thinking he's gonna flex his striking, I think it's still very possible for virtually any MMA fighter to get. Chewed up on the feet by Stephen Thompson. Yeah, he's been taking people down too much lately. Yeah, so. oh yeah. I, I think that's right. If he's scared enough to take down, who was it? Um, like, you know, he had that terrible fight with, um, like, single big punch man. Um, uh, Nursultan Rizaboyev? No, uh, Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Oh, yeah. If he's scared enough to just be out there shooting doubles on Abdul Razak Al Hassan, he's definitely going to be doing it on even a decrepit Stephen Thompson. Oh yeah, no, I don't doubt it. He's been hitting takedowns uh, basically throughout his entire welterweight run. I mean, he crushed Vicente Luque on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, he got plenty of good takedowns against Ruzaboyev. They the wrestling has been a has become a really regular part of his game at one seventy. So yeah, and basically anybody who suggests a takedown these days, including Kevin Holland, will manage to get Stephen Thompson to the ground. He just, okay. just he just forgot how to wrestle. He got too old to continue having the like the late edition skills in his wheelhouse. He's he's reverted to classic Stephen Thompson form. Yeah, and then you know the rest of the card is mostly people that you've heard of. Uh, Marina Rodriguez, Yasmin Nacindo should be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Austin Hubbard, Alexander Hernandez should be decent. Mm-hmm. Um, Tisha uh, Pennington, Nate Torres, Carla Esparza is like. Carla Esparza making her first appearance in a very long time, I think. Almost as long as Pena, probably. Yeah. November mm-hmm. 2022, she lost to the title. Oh, yeah. To uh, yep. Wei, Wei Li Zhang. Yep. That's a sort of unofficial women's atom weight belt fight. Yep. Oh, uh, and yeah, Colt McGee Tim Means is like a just like a real old person's fight. Yeah, you know what though? If they're going to give Tim Means any more fights, oh, cool. you know, I'll say right now, mm-hmm. if anybody uh, wants to go check out uh, an older piece from a few months ago now on my Substack. I did write about Tim Means after he got knocked out by Uros Medic. It wasn't about him getting knocked out by Uros Medic. Rather, it was about the uh, the great sort of dark horse career full of um, just little sparkling moments of great technique and, and toughness and everything that, that Tim Means had. I mean, the guy's had like 50 plus fights and uh, has been doing it forever. And uh, it was kind of a sad piece because I was celebrating how this is just the kind of guy who was never going to break through into the tippy top, but was always very good. And even the like elite contenders, which tended to be the kind of fighters he would lose to, they would usually have a very tough fight with him. Yep. And um, so given that, I feel that it is a it is respectful to give Tim Means a matchup like this at this point in his career. And likewise for Court McGee. Both these dudes have been through the ringer. They are both nearing the ends of their careers. And uh, let two slow, old uh, grinders 
take each other on. I'm I'm cool with that. It's a Legends League kind of matchup. Mm-hmm. As I said, like pretty much the entire card, top to bottom, is not. It's not like an amazing pay per view. Yeah, it's very. Not. There's little about it that makes you go, "Oh my god, I must see that." Yeah, but the whole thing is at least like relevant, and it's people that you you know and care about. Yeah. In fact, I would almost say that Aldo Bautista's is, is maybe the only fight in this card where I would say that's perfect matchmaking. Yeah, I think that's the only like that's real a, must-see fight, to be honest. That's the only really the tantalizing matchup where you're like, ooh, I wonder mm-hmm. what's going to happen. Yeah. Um. So, you know, I've seen worse. <laughs> UFC yeah. 307, tagline, I've seen worse. Um. Okay. Well, let's call it there. Um, find us on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson at Boxing Bush. Check out my Substack. I had, um, of course, last month my piece on pivots, which everyone seemed to enjoy. It was quite successful by the standards of my Substack. Pivots do work in MMA, and I wrote a surprisingly long piece uh, talking about this idiotic debate and arguing that point. Uh, which you can check out over there, and that one is free to read. And then most recently, I published a breakdown of Daniel Dubois' uh, shocking upset win, um, which was itself a really great and promising performance uh, over Anthony Joshua. So facepunching.substack.com for that. Check out Heavy Hands on Patreon. It is well delayed at this point, but Miguel Class and I uh, will be recording our episode of Heavy Henka for the uh, last sumo tournament. That will be coming out very soon on the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash heavy hands. And we will be back next week to talk about UFC 307 in hindsight, uh, as well as... Uh, Maybe what? something where like some couple dudes are like going to be punching each other. Probably. Uh Bobby against Bibi Lev or whatever it is. Oh, thingy. it's uh, it's uh, Brandon Rival versus Tatsuro Tyra. Mm-hmm. Which uh, actually, also like some actually looks some like punching a punching thing. We should be remembering Connor. It's coming out. Is it next week? A punching thing. Uh, that's the pivot, right? Oh, well, we can talk about that. I know. Yeah. You, I know you had your eye on Dimitri Bivol. Like everyone does at the moment. We should talk about it. I would be happy to talk about that. Okay, we'll talk about some boxing next week too, then, if we've uh, if we've got time for it. Great. Anyway, that's all for next week. Until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. <laughs> <laughs>